Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Tachlis. Thank you so much for joining us today. Today we have the honor and privilege to have you, my dear friend Yosef Shleim Espira. Um, soon you'll find out why I call him my dear friend. For many, many reasons and many, many years we go back and we had a lot of good times together, some sad times together. And we are very, we have a very good rapport. So we are so glad to bring him to our studio to do our first podcast. And let's get straight to it. How are you, Mr. Shapiro? Baruch Hashem, thank you very much for having me. And uh, Mr. Reb, Reb Aaron, as oh. I would say, is uh, absolutely correct. We go back a long time. And it's an honor and a privilege to have you as a friend. And Mr. Blumenfeld, as we call him today, or Reb Aaron, whatever, whatever works. works, Reb Aaron, has been a listening ear and a shoulder to lean on for me and my family for many, many years. It's actually thanks to him that I'm here where I am today. So, so let me ask you, why are you here today? I have no idea. But <laughs> the, I'm actually surprised that this, this interview is taking place in English. Not my first language, not my preferred language either. But um, what, so, is, what is your preferred language? Preferred language is Yiddish. Nice language. Beautiful. And it's taking us a long way. And um, so we'll do the best we can in the English language. So some listeners will be able to understand us better. Yes, that's the goal. Yeah. Our goal is our listeners. They are the they own the show, they own the content. They can tell me, they can tell us what's good, what's not good, what to delete, what to highlight. It's all about the listeners. I would think that I found you to be very, very grounded. Why am I saying it? Because we all have challenges in life and we all have larger and smaller issues to deal with. And all our challenges come from Hashem, obviously. And often we don't understand why Hashem is doing things to us. The good things and the not such good things. If we suddenly make somewhere a nice bulk of money, we never think why Hashem did it to us. But unfortunately, sometime in life we have sad and difficult things to deal with. And then we think that Hashem is, is running his world in an interesting way. But if you see someone that had a big challenge in his life and he overcame the challenge in such a powerful and meaningful way, to me, it's an inspiration. So I'd like to speak to you today with your permission about your big challenge. So you say challenge, and I'm going to ask you a question. We have, uh, which challenge are you talking about? <laughs> That's a cute I've one. Been, uh, my next birthday, I'll be 56. Congratulations. Married, married for, I remember, 36 years, 1985, 36 years plus. And so the challenge can mean Shalom Bias, marriage, mm -hmm. financial, large family, oh, a sure. disabled child, or as my wife calls it, differently abled child. I like that with challenges for 27 years or many other things in life that are challenging. Mm -hmm. So which one do we want to concentrate on? So I think that we may have to invite you for four or five separate episodes because I'm sure and I know some of you, part of your history and I know that you dealt with many of your challenges in a very unique way. But today I I choose to, with your permission, to talk about what I think was probably your biggest challenge in life. I know that you had a child that really turned your life around in many, many ways. I knew the child somewhat, not so well, but I knew him, I saw him often, I never interacted with him. But the way you and your wife and your family dealt with your child really took me by storm and I was really baffled of how parents can overcome such a big challenge and come out like winners, not only winners, I can say leaders in this industry. 
So with your permission, let's talk about what happened with your dear son. I would uh, completely agree with you on the fact that it's the, it is the biggest challenge. And the reason it's the biggest is only because it's a surprise. Marriage, every child knows when you get it, when you're going to get married, there are challenges. Adjustments to be made. Financial challenges. Every child knows it. Again, you get an adult, become an adult, you have to find yourself to financially support yourself. Sometimes surprises will happen there also. When you have a large family of kids, challenges, normal, expected. When you have a child who, six months after he's being born, has a meningitis, which is a brain infection, and never recovers from it and becomes completely... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Immobile, non-functional, many of his abilities was disabled. And that's kind of a surprise. Mm -hmm. Not supposed to be that way. I think surprise is an understatement. That's the yeah, it's the element of surprise that makes the challenge the biggest of the all, all the challenges. And all of a sudden you're 22 years old and it's child number three, and you just don't know what hit you and don't know what to do, how you have to start life. So one sad part, looking back in retrospect, is our parents, who are from the previous generation, would have wanted it very much to be a secret. For about a year and a year and a half, I think it was, it was a secret. Mm -hmm. wow. Nobody was supposed to know. So we had to go to a wedding, Kutura Simcha, this child was left with a babysitter, so to speak. Which makes the challenge so much greater and bigger. Which makes it a lot more trauma because you have nobody to share with. Wow. Um, with your permission, I want to back up, back up a little and hear just the basics. What happened? When it happened? How did you find out? Like, I believe it was born normal. If, am I correct? Yeah, yeah. So my son, child number three. What was his name? Shmuli. Shmuli. Or Shmuli Ephraim, for those who, in the family that like to call Shmuli Ephraim. Right. He was born normal, was born on right after Pesach. We went to Israel in Cheshvan, my wife and I and the baby, of course. Normal trip. We came home on a Sunday morning, and the baby of ours at the time, like Wednesday, Thursday, started not feeling well, something like that. Went to the doctor, doctor had an ear infection, gave him some antibiotic, nothing was moving, still had fever, and the child was lethargic and um, listless, as we can call it now. And little did we know that he had a meningitis going on at the same time, basically being misdiagnosed, or it was an ear infection on top of meningitis. We don't know yet, we didn't know at the time. So the doctor said, go home till after the weekend and uh, come back and see me on Monday morning if nothing changes. We, we called Friday to complain and said, none. And Lamaisa, it turned out that at that time, Sunday afternoon came around, he, I found, we found him in the bed, breathing very heavily. It looked no good. So of course we called the ambulance and we were going to the hospital. By the time we got to the hospital, his eyes was rolled back, no oxygen for a few minutes. <coughs> Resuscitation took place. Which is known to be one of the biggest, um, um, one of the most affecting issues in a person's life, not to have oxygen in the brain for a few it, minutes. It damages the brain. Correct. And sometimes wow. it's permanently, and sometimes it could be recovered. It depends how, the, how deep the damage was. So we found ourselves uh, with a brain damaged child, and which we basically never really recovered from. Wow. And from there, we went to therapy, hospitalizations, surgeries, back and forth. We put a shunt in his, to his brain to drain the fluid. And then because he was immobile for a long time, his hip gave, gave way. We had to do a hip replacement. And the other side, his uh, ligaments kind of became very tight. Except for his heart and urology, I think every single part of his body eventually was... Okay, started giving up. Giving up, being fixed, repaired, medication, and so on and so forth. Wow. Do you, do you believe, I know everything is Bashet, we all believe that, but do you believe that it was human error that caused 
the derailment and the deterioration of the condition? Uh, I would answer like this, it doesn't really matter. Wow. Because I may, I once made a statement, and I'm not, maybe you were present at the time many years ago. As you know, I like to speak. Yes. I like to speak to people. I, with me, myself, without people, I'm dead. Right. I need people around me. That's so one of the reasons you're here, by the way. <laughs> so I made a statement at the time, and I got a little flag for it. I said, if I had to live life all over again, I would choose it with a sick child. People said, yes, yeah, Shlom, you're not supposed to talk like that. No, this is not good. You don't talk like that. You know what you just said? I, I'm one of those people. So I said, I'll take it back. I'll correct my statement. If I have to live life all over again, I would choose it with the benefits that a sick child brings into the house. Wow. So it doesn't really matter how it happened. The fact of the matter is that eventually we had to deal with these challenges on a daily basis. Simple stuff like going to a wedding or getting the whole family together and go somebody was not an option in our household. There was always one of us had to be stay home. A brother-in-law gets <clears throat> married in Belgium. Naturally, everybody goes. So my wife meant herself because her brother got married wow. and so on and so forth. This is like little things. I, I was going to say. And then going to hospitalizations where we do the, old, the other kids. And if I may add, the easiest part of having a sick child at home is the sick child himself or herself. Wow. Every part of the body has their own specialist. It would be brain, eyes, chin, skin, uh, what's this called? Legs, this, uh, hands, everything. The orthopedic doctors, uh, gastro doctors, uh, neurosurgeon, neurology, everybody. The problem is the healthy ones around us. Not to mention the family, we'll get there in a moment. Mm -hmm. That makes it even hard. But even, I was more concerned for my son, Moshi and Malki, who were then little kids, that we had to give away every once in a while, going to hospitals, we send them to a neighbor, to a friend, to a sister-in-law. And I, I pity them much more because they, they, were, they had the right to have normal... Upbringing. Normal parents. Growing, right, normal parents. parents. They didn't have that for a long time. How, how do you... I, I know they were young at the time, but... How do you sh break the news or how do you bring in siblings to the situation that happened in your house? How do you, how do you make them part, of, part of, the, of the story, of the dilemma? Besides the fact of wanting to protect them and to have them growing up normally, but like, how do you break the news to them? So as I was saying about um, siblings, no, so the siblings, this is child number three, so the first two were little kids, they were two years old, my daughter and my son was one year old, mm -hmm. so there's no news to break to them, it's a new baby and we're going to the hospital, we're going this and that and the other things, so they kind of, now the rest of the kids were born into it. Obviously it was for them easier. Now, so it wasn't breaking news to them, it was their, their experience in our whole life basically was, if I may elaborate a little more now, they saw us parents doing what we were really doing. So everybody become, became involved. It wasn't like the kids were not able to go to school and tell, not tell their kids, their friends, that they don't have a... Other it was pink, just the other, the other way around. They would go, we have, have a special brother. Uh -huh. So I want to I wanna stop at two, three points. Number one, today, 2020, when you have, when one has a sick child or a challenged child, we graduated to call them special children. And that, I think that's a tremendous accomplishment. Some organizations, I know HASC, used to call them special children. Slowly it grew, it grew on us that they are special children. They're not bad or hard children. But I think in those days, going back um, 28 years ago, more, 28 to 30 years ago, I don't think the the label of special children was so popular and common. So it brings me back to ask you again, like, how did you and your wife and your kids felt somewhat comfortable to go out there and not be embarrassed about the brother, the, the, the thing that they have in the house called a sick brother or a sick child? Okay, very, very well, well asked question. 
the uh, going back 1988 was my, when someone was born, which is 30 something years ago. No, I was the first Hasidic person to push an own child in a wheelchair on the streets. Wow. Now, how did the Koyach to do that? Very simple, because I was angry enough. That comes back to everything is kind of a shared, as we like to say. So the fact of the matter that it was supposed to be a secret for a year and a half, a year and a half is a very long time to keep a secret, oh my. especially when you like to go out and deal with people and so on and so forth. Socialize, live life. Socialize, live life, like exactly. So a certain anger builds up in you and you're asking yourself every single minute of the day, why am I keeping this a secret? Because my elderly parents thought it was the right thing to do. And we couldn't understand why. Had I gone to Macy's and had a choice of buying children or kids, and I'll pick a sick one over a healthy one, okay, good, I agreed. He did made a super move. Shame on you. You know, Macy's was almost in bankruptcy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so having a child... But like any other child, and the trend just made it to be different. What does it got to do with me? Why do I have to keep a secret? I, I was going to ask you a question, but I was going to ask it later in the game. But I want to ask it now. It's a, tough, it's a tough question. I vaguely remember that in the first few years, I'm, I'm really polishing up what you just said, but I prepared this as a question for you. I'm okay. sorry. I vaguely remember that the first few years, you were kind of locked and so secretive about what happened to you. And at one point, the champagne bottle popped open and you became the most outspoken, noisemaker, conversationalist about this issue. And I was going to ask you soon, what flipped the coin from one end to the other end? What happened? Accumulation of anger. Wow. Three words. I was angry at myself for listening to people who didn't understand me. And for the life of me, as many times as I asked, they couldn't give me a good answer. Answers about what? Why should I keep it a secret? Now it'll come with Shaduchim. You'll not be able to make Shaduchim with the kids. Shaduchim for me at the time was like very far away, okay. like 20 years out. Right. I wasn't even thinking, so, so maybe they are right, maybe they're not. But then again, I felt miserable not to be able to share with anybody this big secret every single day every single day and my wife the same thing and at one point I kind of said to my wife this is it so I remember wow. driving down to Montsea I had to pick a person that I'm going to tell the story so I picked a person the lucky winner yes I picked a person in Montsea who I knew he knows a little bit about medical and I drove down to him and I called him up and said can I come and speak to you about something important to me said, okay, come tomorrow, 8 o'clock, whatever, made up a time. And I told him my story. Driving back to Borough Park that night was, for me, the most pleasurable trip I had ever had. Wow. Felt relieved. Nothing happened. I told it to somebody. I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm still the same person. I can think. I can still go out and sell life insurance. This is what I do for a living. And it's even better now because I, I had a whole big bundle off my shoulder. It's working wow. beautiful. So, and I told my wife, of course, how the conversation went. And we still had an issue because my wife was still in this blocked place. She, had that, she didn't have that person yet to speak with. So that was an issue in itself. Now going back to the Shulabai issue, right? right? So that was kind That's of an adjustment. Separate, separate, separate podcast. Separate, separate discussion, yes. <clears throat> so with that happening, we decided that we're going public with the story and it's going to be a public event. And we didn't do anything wrong. We're doing for this kid whatever we can possible. Wow. And we'll continue to do that and screw the world. What a game changer, huh? And that's what you might remember. I popped open and it was you're absolutely correct. Wow. And not only that, you became the biggest advocate. You went around to people who have sick children, to people who have yeah, difficulties yeah, in yeah. life. I'm sure it, it happened slowly. Yeah, that came with the territory, but right. that, that wasn't my, uh, my... My intention was for me to do no, the right thing. obviously. You wanted to... I, I want to do, we want to do the right thing with our child in the right way, and there's nothing to be embarrassed about sticking up for your kids. When you have normal kids, every child is a different level. Right. Would you not treat the older kids according to their needs? Oh. Absolutely. So why was my son any different? I heard once a beautiful line that um, some people, ki kids have challenges, some people have hearing issues, some people have small issues. So let's say for hearing, I heard it in reference to hearing, so they have those little 
Baruch Hashem, they have the little solutions. They put a certain they plant in something in the air, and they can hear better. And some parents didn't graduate to the point that you did, and they feel very uncomfortable and embarrassed about it. So one of the parents I, 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 used, I spoke with, they told me they, they flipped the coin. Someone told them, why is eyeglasses different than hearing aids? This child cannot see well, they wear glasses. This child cannot hear well, they wear hearing aids. And there was really beautiful perspective, which takes people to a calmer place, to a better place, to a healthier place, and they can deal with the issue in a much more productive and meaningful way. So it's funny you mentioning the hearing aid thing. My grandfather, though he's not alive anymore, he was looking for a shudder for his daughter, his first daughter. So his daughter is now 77 years old. So mm-hmm. we're talking about some 50-something years ago. Or, see, yeah. So he would look for a bocher that does not wear eyeglasses. <laughs> the reason? My daughter doesn't deserve a blind boy. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Lo and behold, until today's day, her husband does not wear eyeglasses. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> it's true. That's really cute. It's a true story. But it, it, it shows you the advancement, Baruch Hashem, yeah. of the generations. Yeah. Here's yeah. no glasses. And today we have glasses and nothing, lenses, laser correction, all these things. Then we have hearing aids. Hearing assistant. Assistant, that's a nicer word. And then we have Yasser Shloyme telling us that his child, who is very, very disabled and sick, Baruch Hashem, there's nothing wrong by opening up and bringing him out to the street, treating him outside like a regular child from the point of visibility and exposure. I think it's Baruch Hashem, an amazing advancement that the world has come to. Yes, and if I may uh, brag about myself as well, I was the first one here in Brooklyn who made a bar mitzvah for a wow. child in a wheelchair wow. that has no ability of talking, walking, or doing anything wow, voluntarily wow. except for smiling or crying. Wow. That and must have been some event. It was a very interesting event because a lot of people who were invited did not know that this is a disabled child. And it was actually challenging, not challenging, it was actually fun <laughs> to watch people coming in who are very close with me, oh, this, this is your child? You're making a bar mitzvah for him? And you would see people would kind of talk to each other like this. What are you supposed to do with the present? Because they brought presents for a, safer for a normal boy. And all of a sudden, they're kind wow. of hiding in between the chairs. So that was uh, the fun part. Wow. But Baruch Hashem, today's day and age, a, a disabled child or whatever you want, special needs child, whatever we call them, they are special. And you have many buses, vans, you have a must you have RAIM, you have all these organizations. Parents are not embarrassed, they're doing the right thing. And, um, and I want to come to another point, which is very challenging still today. Because I do get calls from time to time where a young couple having a child, they found out that uh, either the child is Down syndrome or some other long, uh, whatever, some challenging issue with the child. And a parent would call them up and say, give the child away. Yeah. Now, the lady just gave birth. She's not back to herself yet. We're, you know, let's call it back to her normal stage. Right. And she's being pressured by a parent, give this child up because A, B, and C. Usually it has nothing to do with the baby or the mother just gave birth. Usually I find it to be it's an ego of a grandparent. And they would call me and tell me, can you call my daughter and encourage her to give away wow. a child since you went through a very hard time? Of course, I don't do this. If, if anything, anything the opposite. I tell the parent, bug out, it's none of your business. Hashem gave it to them because in reality, Hashem had two other options. Either give the mother a sick child or give the new mo- the, the, I'm talking, the grandmother a sick child or the new, <clears throat> the new mother just gave birth, the grandmother's brain. Wow. Two other options. It's so a Hashem very chose deep philosophy, but yeah, Hashem chose to give it to the, these, these two people, husband and wife. They will figure out how to do this. Wow. Now, if someone doesn't want to take the test, uh, I would um, have a you know we can have a talk about that as well. Yes. Um, so the, the question is really, what, what, what chizuk, what tools, if Chazal Shalom something like this happens to a young couple totally brand new. What, how can they start collecting a, 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 a toolbox with 
for to have the strength, to have the ability to cope and deal with such a thing. Baruch Hashem, you look so seasoned in this issue. And yeah. I know it took many, many years of very hard work and, and selflessness and commitment and betuchen and stuff like this. I want to talk about Hashem soon. I should have started with Hashem. But I cannot talk about Hashem when you, when you have the difficulty. I can talk about Hashem when I see something good and you, something nice and big. But how does Chaz V'Sholem, if something like this happens to a young couple or to anyone, give us a little summary. How should they gather themselves and start dealing with such a challenging thing, not knowing anything about life, let alone this particular challenge? What would you tell them? Loaded question, and the answer is as follows. We have to go back in time when prior to GPSs, when we need to drive to some place. So we would, uh, let's say you want to go to Montreal. There's no GPS. You have no idea Montreal is on the map. You barely have a map. So first you have to find a map. You find, to find out where Montreal is and where you, are, where you are. And then you would ask a person, did you ever travel to Montreal? When is the best time to leave, traffic-wise, weather-wise? Getting to the border, when is it the least busy? When is it very busy? So you ask a person to travel that road, chances are you'll get there very appropriately. Reasonably well. Yeah, reasonably well, like I say. Now, I always use the opposite example. I mean, you have people in this, this, this day and age, they would want to travel to Montreal from Brooklyn, you have to travel north. And they would sit on to the New Jersey turn, Turnpike South, heading to Florida, and you would call them, sir, you're going the wrong direction. Don't tell me what to do. I have three lanes over here, beautiful weather, no cops, I can speed. It's working beautiful, I'll get there. So what would you do if, if your good friend is doing it? Would you stop him? Of course you would stop and tell him, turn around, they got to run north, or else you're going to get to Florida, right. not to Montreal. Montreal. Same thing with every challenge in life. I personally, I don't know if everybody does that, I have never ever made a decision without discussing it with somebody else. Period. And that somebody else does not have to be somebody who's older than me, more mature than me, can be younger than me. In fact, my, today's day and age, my current rabbi, mm -hmm. coach, <clears throat> Rabbi Panet, who you know well, right. is younger, for, younger than me, about 15 years. And without him, I wouldn't be any place close to where I am today. Wow. And he got a good plug now. Yeah, okay. He deserves it. Yeah, he deserves a lot more than that. The master. And now I do have other friends as well. And then I'm quoting always a friend of mine who happens to be an attorney, a Hasidic guy. Yeah. And we were, we were talking, I don't know even what we were talking about. He, he said one line, uh, like a one liner to me at one point that sticks to me lower your expectation, you will never be disappointed. Yeah. So when you have a challenge and, and you need to gather the, your tools, go talk to somebody who actually traveled that road. And actually talk to both people. Some people actually gave away a child. Now, and I did this as well. And let me back you up with a story. I don't know if people will like to hear it or not. But yeah, it's a story. It's because it happened. So it was suggested to us, my wife and I, to give away the child. And at one point, my son was stable. My wife and I were stable enough to listen to other people. Maybe they are right. Maybe we should give away. That, All right, so let's go find some people who gave away children. Right. Where did he put the child? So we found out where they put the child. I remember one time we traveled to Albany. Three and a half hour ride. And we traveled to a place called, I don't remember the name, Saint something. We went into that place. It was a stunning, beautiful building. The, the paint colors for children was beautiful. The However, grass, the outside. Outside, gorgeous. However, on the floor inside, this big ballroom, that's the time we can come visit. You had like a little, not even beds, I don't even know what, what you'd call them. Maybe cuts. Maybe a cut where the children would be laying on and doing nothing, literally, and waiting for their turn to get therapy or different uh, programs or food, whatever. Treatments, yeah. whatever. And when I asked the uh, people in charge of it, what's the story of it? What's, what's going on here? I says, okay, yeah, this is what we uh, do with the children. We're just waiting for them to... Uh, Next number. To live their life and make them as comfortable as possible. And when the time comes... We just let them go. And I said, something, something is wrong here. I'm not going to put my child here. I mean, and then we got into discussion. Their policy was not to resuscitate kids. Wow. 
Because if God wants to take them away, it wasn't a Jewish place, it was, God takes them away, it's time for them to go, and that's to, to roll on to the next patient. So we went to visit these parents. We actually spoke to the parents. Of a child that was in this Of that particular child, they were from Brooklyn, our community from here, Borough Park. And the child was there, and so we went to parents. So how does, how, how does it work out? You gave the child away, what do you, do, what do you tell the other kids? And um, how did it work out? So the mother answered very simply like this. Physically, it's a lot easier. Because you have a child less in the house, you have to pick him up, change a pamper for a six-year-old. It's not, not so easy. Pain. All, the physical element of having any child, especially a physical limited child, is it's hard. So that hardship is gone. Emotionally, at first we went every month, we went to down to Albany to visit, and then every six months, and then every year. And then we kind of, uh, we go whenever we decide we feel we need to go. And then we're, she added... We're waiting for the punchline. And then she added something very interestingly. But I want to tell you something. So, so what do you tell the other kids? So we tell, tell the kids, let's make the child, child's name, we'll make it Yossi, not a real name. And we told the kids that Yossi's not feeling well, and he's in a place where they take care of children who don't feel well. Okay. So one day, little three or four year old kid in the house, the most safest place is next to the mother in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. Mommy, if I'm not gonna feel well, am I gonna go to the same place where Yossi is? Oh my goodness. And oh that was goodness. a decision maker for us. My child, our child, never goes nowhere. Wow. Stays in the house for as long as child wants to stay in the house. And my children are aware of the story, because we told them to them. And any hardship that came afterwards is challenging as it was. That's the way, uh, wow. let me jump ahead a few years, like 20 years later, when my son passed away, five years ago. Yeah, well, I was gonna when get break the news to the audience that unfortunately. So he was in the hospital for like four weeks or six weeks, like kind of dying. And my little son, it wasn't so little anymore, he was like nine or 10 years old. He asked me, Tati, why are you going to Shmuni to the hospital every day? Very good question. My answer was even wilder, I think. I didn't think a moment before I answered it, but I think it's a good message. I told him I would do the same to you if you were in the hospital. Wow. It was a very strong answer, and it resonates with him till today. Wow. And my kids know that I would have done everything to every child of my house. So um, I hope that answers the question. <laughs> <laughs> More than I can digest. <clears throat> wow. Um, it's, it's so hard to, to, to summarize and to go forward, fast forward 10, 15 years. You think it made your family, before I'm ask, I'll ask about you and your wife, you think it made your family a stronger, a more united, a more um, positive family, the experience? Or you think it brought some weakness and some... Um, I don't want to say sadness. I know your kids are not sad. I know some of them very well. But if it brought some a certain cloud over the life of your family. So if I may mix in a little Hebrew ling linguistic over here. Linguistic? Lingo? Yeah. What is it called? Lingo. Lingo. Hebrew lingo. In the Israeli military, they teach you, yes. what doesn't kill you, builds you. In reality, a lot of people, any challenge in life will either bring you closer or make you, bring you more apart. So basically, we looked at our weaknesses, what we can and we cannot do, and we started building it up. Wow. And we had no choice because... I'm starting to figure out why I invited you to this podcast. <laughs> many people will treasure and listen to what you say and wow what a strong message and obviously i know some of your kids as i said Leanne Hara, so, salad, Hashem. so the real challenge is if there's any parent out there who who was dealing with a sick child i think the real challenge is the the parents the grandparents they have an opinion they didn't go through any challenges in their life of this sort most likely and they come in and tell you what to do and how to do it, and you feel like obligated or guilty to listen to them or not to listen to them. You get and confused. You get guilty. You get no, because to a parent you're used to listen to. Right. And 
if you look in in Shulchan Aruch, keep it off. Let me go there for a moment. If your father tells you to put on a coat because he is cold, and you do not put on a coat, you're not over and keep it off. That's not keep it up at all. Right. So the same thing is when a father tells you an opinion about a medical issue or things this, things that. I don't think you're over any keep it off. Ask your local rabbi, of course. <laughs> I don't have any keep it off by not listening to them. You got to do what's right for you. And um, I would like to say it in a very strong way, but I don't know how. Parents are a problem. Grandparents are a problem. Wow. They are. Wow, watch out, your grandparents. You don't want to hear that about you. But I totally, I totally understand. I know by Shadichim, many, many parents are blocking the children from making Shadichim that would be right for them and for the child for, for political reasons, for prestige reasons, and stuff like this. But it's definitely something we have to... The, the art would be to do it smoothly and to do it smartly and to tell the parents I hear you, I will consider, but it's a very, as you said, it's a very difficult, there's a famous, uh, one of the Geir Rebbe's decide in Israel decided to open, play, uh, to open, uh, so in his it's called Kiryah, in Ashdod and in Arad, these places, and young couples had to move away for five years, the first five years after they got married, so the parents do not mix into their life and do not shape their life the way they want the children's life to look. No, life is to be shaped in a normal, natural way. And if you have good children, you should have to trust them and you have to empower them to do the right thing, but not mix in and not try to make them do what you feel is the right thing to do. Wow. Let me, let me, let me jump in for a moment. If you want to go back to Empirical Ovis, Asei L'Churav, Eknei L'Chuchover. What does that mean? Eknei L'Chuchover, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is go pay a therapist. Now, of course, therapy, nah, nothing's wrong with me, nothing's wrong with me, good, we're strong people. So nobody wants to go to therapist. So call it something else. Call it a coach. Oh, I was waiting for this. Yes, <laughs> call it for a coach, get yourself a good coach and pay for it. Because if, you know, they say, an attorney doesn't cost any money, it's worth as much as he costs. Yeah. So pay for a coach, and, and that's what Chazal tells us. It doesn't anyway say, ask your father, or your shver, or your in-laws, no. Sell her off, go to your rabbi. Or yes, if you're comfortable with Chovra, you can spill to. spill all the beans and they will give you an honest straight answer. Or even just listening. Well that's listening, uh, that's eighty percent of the answers. Listening That's the reason we have two ears and one mouth. Oh, correct. So we, listen more and talk half. Exactly. Right. I heard it from you many years ago. <laughs> that's so true. <laughs> um wow. Wow. Let's talk about let's talk about Hashem for a minute. Oh, because he's before, he's during, and he's after. It's all about Hashem. When you found out the severity of the situation, did you, did you call him up, say, Hashem, I need to speak with you? We absolutely did. So the first thing is denial, like everything else in life. When something goes wrong, uh-oh. You say, no, it's not happening for sure. So that's a natural reaction. A child would have made a, uh, what is it called, this, uh, a tantrum? Throw a tantrum. Throw a tantrum. We adults, we say, no, impossible. That's a tantrum, an adult version right. of. And then denial, then the, until acceptance is a long way, short of some others. And that's the time, of course, we call on Hashem. We daven, and we ask. We try to understand, and we ask for strength. And that's, we always ask, just give us the strength, what it takes to handle the situation. We'll handle it, just give us the strength. But mo most people would have one stage earlier, like, Hashem, you are the master, you do everything, you are the one doing the good and what looks bad. Why did you do it? Why? I'm young, I'm helpless. Why did you do it? What, what, what happened to me here? Oh, how do I answer this question? I don't know. I'm going to give some credit to my father, maybe. So my father's a very nice person, lives up in Muncie, New York. Used to be very balbatish. Then came a time where the whole diamond industry went kind of... South. South, and he had no money anymore. 
and he nev- he chose never to go on to these uh, city programs like food stamps, Medicaid for some reason. You know, he's saying Hashem can give it to me straight in cash, and we're just going to do it like that. He married off twelve children. I was I was the first one, and I saw him managing all this with faith and and just believe and trust in Hashem that everything will be okay, wow. and it worked out that way. So maybe. I took some a little bit of that. Some credit. Grandparents. Too, yeah. They get yeah, some yeah, credit. Yeah, <laughs> grandparents do get some credit, yeah. Wow. They get wow. a lot of credit because we are who, who they made us to be. Obviously. And, uh, yeah. So wow. I'll take them. Maybe it's like that. I'm not sure myself that's how this... Uh... Wow. But then again, once you're in business for yourself, um, I'm in the life insurance business, like I said, you see it every day. Shem is all around every day. Yeah, but Shem today is the big awareness... To connect to Hashem, to oh, thank share you, Hashem. with Him, and thank Him constantly, and I really see in many people it makes them secure, calmer. We should not be tested on such big challenges, but I think all in all, those days and such a big problem it was was. I think Hashem would would be okay if you question Him for a few minutes after something like this happens. He wants you to question Him. Yes, correct. But <laughs> to say it as a officially questioning Hashem is is okay, and that's why I asked you how how did you how what did he answer you when you asked him when you questioned him what did he answer you? If I may mix into the relationship between you and Hashem. Um, so I'll tell you. We learned so I remember we are. Which means the same way you thank Hashem for the good things, you should be thanking for the bad things. Mm-hmm. I was a little kid in, in, in the Cheder, and, and I asked the question to Rabbi. Really? My mom gives me a piece of ice cream. I say thank you. And she gives me a smack in the face, the same thing. Hashem, this is just the same? Yeah. No, you have to understand that certain madregas, certain rebbes, and not everybody reaches that madrega. Uh, yeah, and then they go over these stories which I never, never bought because I want a real answer in the language that I spoke, mm-hmm. which is Yiddish. So it was two years ago, sitting at my shir every night, Rebbe Luzin and Ruben, and we learned this Gemara. And he said, at the end of the shir... One shir's, minute, one minute. And yes, Shlom Shapira does not hesitate to raise his finger and say, I have a question. That's right. That's in right. public. And that question is something that bothered me for many, many years, literally 45 years. I was never able to get a straight answer. So he answered like this, he said, when Shem gives you something bad, sure you should cry. He gives you pain, you should cry, open the tilim, give tzedakah, ask and pray and daven and, and yeah, that's not and sure. Now, two years from now, when you find out that that thing that happened to you two years ago was really a toiva, was really something good for you, that's when you thank Hashem. Wow. It's, not, it's not supposed to be instantly. So you ask me what Hashem answered me? Sometimes wow. he never answered. Sometimes he made me wait a few years for an answer. And sometimes um, so he us, answered me. Tell us now, looking back, what was the answer of Hashem? I think we should summarize this amazing uh, conversation <laughs> with this challenging question. But it's all about Hashem. The, the goal of this program of Let's Talk Tachlis is to make people believe more, manage more the issues, be part of Yiddishkeit, Love Hashem, love Yiddishkeit. And to hear such a traumatic story and dramatic story has to end with a very positive, and I know you're a very positive person. You're always there to help people and to encourage people, to empower people. You're acting as a super coach without being a certified coach and a super social worker without being certified. So we have to conclude this interview with a very strong message. Tell us how you saw Hashem's goodness in this. I'm sorry if it's too challenging the question, but I'm throwing it at you anyway. Let me first thank you for the kind words. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And uh, I do have a question for you, though, since you are a coach. I do have a question mm. before we end this uh, conversation. Okay. Should we do it off the air? or We'll do it here. Let everybody pitch in if they want us to yes, help, help me out. We invite everyone to please join us. Send us your email. Your co- on email, your comments, your suggestions your observations, how you felt about this program. And I I promise you, Mr. Shapiro will be invited again. He has a lot to say, obviously, as you can see. But before you ask me my question, don't run away, don't hide. We're not going to, I'm going to ask you the question first. 
because I want everybody to answer me this question. It still bothers me. Okay. Why is it when Hashem gives you a lot of good things? I have a family of kids, Baruch Hashem, healthy. They're getting married, grandkids. Right. They go to yeshivas. They learn well. A lot of, a lot of good things happening in a person's life. You're healthy. You're walking on your feet. You have a wife. You have a spouse. Um, why is it that when you have one little challenge, I'm going to say little because I just want to minimize it, why not? You have a small challenge and that pulls you down to a point where you cannot even concentrate on all the good things in life. That's a question that I have. Mm-hmm. Want me to answer? I want you to answer. Then you're and then I'll tell version. you what my fr- attorney friend who was 16 or 17 years younger than me answered me very, very simple. Can you give me his business card after this <laughs> Absolutely. podcast? Yes. So I think that number one, it's instinct, it's human instinct to expect the good and think that I deserve it and life is good. And good, when good comes my way, I don't even stop for a minute and pay attention that, wow, good came my way. And when bad comes away, you get angry. Why? What happened? It's supposed to be smooth. It's supposed to go on the road without bumps, without problems. Why is this happening? But I really, lately I heard a very nice concept that our challenges in life are a tool to remind us and bring us closer to Hashem. They're not here to distance us from Hashem. They say, oh, one minute, there's a manager, there's a controller, someone is sitting in the watchtower and now he wants, he wants to communicate with me. Hey, I haven't heard from you for a while. Here, here's a little tidbit going your way. Oh, wake up. Talk to me, communicate, discuss, cry to me, daven to me, we'll take care of it for you. So I, I, I liked it very much because the good we take for granted, unfortunately. So sometimes Hashem should never test any of us with very big challenges. My mother-in-law says in Yiddish, Bahit me God from You want to throw me little challenges here and there? No I'm fine with it. But don't give me big stuff. However, I think that's the difference. Why that's the reason why people take good one way, and they take um, challenges another way, and maybe we have the strength to believe that this is the reason Hashem brings us the challenges. But I definitely want to hear your inspiring answer. I'm sure it's going to be better. No, no, no. I, you took it on a, more like a um, spiritual answer as opposed to a. But the question was really a physical, practical, practical answer that I was looking for, and that guy asked me that you probably know any CEO of a multi-billion dollar corporation, if he has an ingrown toenail, he would call his secretary today, no messages, cancel all my meetings. Now, why ingrown toenail is like so far down our body, like all the way down there, it's by, hidden underneath a sock and a shoe. And now he stops. Why? Little tiny piece of nail growing mm-hmm. into your skin. No, that's what the world's all about. A little thing can pull you down and doesn't right. ever have the reason. So all we have to do is find the good part and, and ride on it. Wow, what a powerful message. So that was kind of an interesting Very twist nice. on it. Amazing, amazing. So I want to thank you so much for being here today. I'm sure our audience and listeners will really grow and learn and get inspired and empowered from your amazing way of taking the challenges Hashem threw at you and your family. And... As I promised, we'll bring you back for many different things. And I'm going to share a little secret that my friend Yasser Shloim has a separate file in his brain for the outcome that happens to people if Chaz Sholem they embarrass and insult and hurt other people. And he has a, he has a collection of real, true life stories of how dangerous and not good it is to speak and be disrespectful to our friends and our spouses and our children and has the show them where it can go. This will be also one very entertaining separate podcast. But for now, thank you so much for watching the Let's Talk Tachlis podcast. We appreciate and we invite your input. Have a great day. Thank you very much. It was nice to be here. And the reason I had a sick child has a story as well.